Welcome to JSA TV, where we're covering the latest news, trends, and innovations from thought leaders from within the digital infrastructure industry. And we are coming at you live. That's right, Mark. We are live from beautiful downtown Austin, Texas at the Data Cloud USA, co-located with Metro Connect or Metro Connect, co-located with Data Cloud USA in beautiful downtown Austin, Texas, home of the Longhorns, the state capital of Texas. No and we're keeping it weird oh. here on JSA TV. <laughs> Couple of ball guys. And speaking, speaking of weird, this gentleman to my right, this good looking gentleman, uh, to my right, my friend, my brother from another mother is Mr. Mark Gusikoff. Mark, my identical twin. That's yeah, right. Mark right. is the CCO of the IDCA. Mark, it is wonderful to see you good to see you again it's been a little while it has been a little while it's been too long yeah it was buffy last week it's you this week it, it was buffy i apologies for, oh. for for this oh no it's great <laughs> oh, it's like looking in a mirror again yeah, I, need, need I love it. glasses but um so um okay uh cco idca why don't you tell our viewers a little bit about yeah. the idca thanks for asking yeah. so idca is the international data center authority we are the global standardization uh, entity within the industry, within digital infrastructure. And we're actually going past many boundaries right now as we're starting to see the advancements in AI, the need for more power, the need for higher density compute, the human capital deficit that's being thrust upon us. Mm -hmm. We're actually going past and, and not just looking at data centers and not just looking at digital infrastructure, but looking at this from a lens of a global digital economy. Mm -hmm. We're working with massive entities. I mean, we're working with countries right now, just signed a deal with Oman uh, for the entire country to support them in their, in their build out. Um, Oman's going to be the next powerhouse in the Middle East for digital deployment. Just super cool. They're strategically located. Uh, they've got the right mindset. You know, they've got the right culture and the right, right uh, interests in being able to be the next global digital superpower. So we're super, super excited to be doing that. We've got our certification programs. We've got our education programs. <coughs> Excuse me. And the one thing that I think, I, I personally, I love that we're doing that no one else in the industry has done is we've actually got a certification program for, you know, I know the, the viewers can't see, but we, we've got a certification program that can accommodate all the people in this room. And no one's done that before where they take the, the systems, the designs, the services, you know, the ancillary equipment and components within the industry to be able to certify that to a level of excellence that's commensurate with what's coming down for mm -hmm. an AI deployment versus a Bitcoin mining operation, being able to put that in perspective and being able to scale it. Nobody else is able to certify people in that capacity. So super excited to be on the adventure and journey with you know my chairman, Mehdi Pariavi, has been traveling all over the darn world, mm -hmm. you know, getting these deals signed all over the place. Uh, we're we're growing at an alarming speed. It's we're keeping up with the AI race. So so what so what exactly is new in the digital economy? I mean, yeah. my from from my seat, it seems like what is new is that it is uh, expanding exponentially. Yeah, is that what's new? What's new? So growth is certainly the thing that we keep hearing. That's the buzzword, like speed to market and and growth. Uh, but scalability has also got to be taken into account of that. I believe that's getting a bit of a backseat in the conversations that mm -hmm. I've been involved with historically. I think we'll talk about nuclear in a, in a minute, but even with definitely nuclear, want to get to that. You yeah. know, we'll talk about growth and scale in nuclear yeah. in a second. But the the power considerations that we have that are thrust upon us, we're 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 behind in that. Um, and again, we'll talk about that with the nuclear piece. But within the global digital economy, we're not just thinking about how are we going to do five megawatt deployments? How are we going to do 10 megawatt deployments? Everybody's looking at a larger need for more power for their critical IT load. Yeah. It's more than just that. You know, when people were making migrations to the cloud years ago and then they had to repatriate to come back, you've got those people who are still in a decision making mode. Yeah. That, you know, three years ago, that was a huge problem. Now, those people are looking at how am I going to keep up with an AI deployment if I need to do AI? Am I going to do liquid cooling? Am I not going to do liquid cooling? And I talk to a lot of people who try to think that they have all the answers. I don't really think that everybody has all of the answers yeah. to be able to do this because people haven't necessarily done it yet. What we're doing is we're creating a grow at scale program. So how are we going to start? Then what will it look like three <laughs> to five years from now? And then where will you want to be in 10 years so that you're not an antiquated facility 10 years from now. Yeah. Like many of the facilities that we see on a day-to-day -day basis are. I remember, you know, when I first got into this industry, you know, four, I think I'm four years in now, a one megawatt, one to five megawatt facility, that was a, considered a good size yeah, facility. Yeah. It wasn't huge, but it was a good size <clears throat> yeah. facility. 
that's like what we're calling like small scale micro yeah. or even like what the old definition of edge yeah. was. Yeah. Edge has evolved. Yeah. Right? So edge was like, oh, it's a small facility and, or it's an unmanned facility or it's yeah, light yeah. lights. No, edge is wherever the network connects to an origin or destination of data, regardless of location or size. Yeah. So now we're seeing edge deployments that are actually like a node, you know, in a country where we're putting these things strategically located around a power source and then being able to supply that, uh, you know, the fiber connectivity and that infrastructure in to be able to support whatever that deployment is at scale. Those are the kinds of things that we're seeing within the digital economy as it changes. And it's not happening at a company level. We're seeing it at a country level. Yeah. Nations are starting to take a heavier handed approach in how they're going to deploy at scale. A brilliant answer to that, that, that very, what I thought was a I'm very simple. smartest guy in the room, but yeah, I, <laughs> oh, I, I try, I try. I thought right. it was a very simple question. I'm like, oh, is this oversimplification? And then, you no, thanks. So thank but you. It's, it, but, but yeah, it, it, it's not an oversimplified question. It's the way that we've got to start thinking. We, we backed ourselves into a corner to get to where we are yeah. right now. Right. And, you know, and we're going to talk about human capital deficit. We backed ourselves in a corner with that. We've got to start thinking. It's critical. When we certify a, a, a deployment, I'll go back to IDCA for one second. When we certify someone, we're not just looking at one piece. Like, it's great if you're resilient and redundant, right? It's great if you have a sustainability initiative. It's great if you have a heat reuse program. All these things are great. But those individual components in and of themselves, just mm -hmm. one piece of that, that is not enough. I'll give you an example. If you're fully fault tolerant and redundant and you've got a facility that as soon as the power shuts off from the grid, uh, your automatic transfer switch kicks on and you're operational. That's great. But if your PUE is 1.6 or 1.8 and your energy efficiency is in the garbage, you are not, I, I got news for you. You're not excellent. You are yeah. not great. What we do is when we look at all of these things, we look at seven layers of efficacy. We don't just look at each one of these components and assess it and stop which is a huge problem in this industry right now. We then go back and correlate each one of those to say, how does your sustainability initiative affect your PUE? How does your overall resiliency and redundancy position affect your sustainability initiative? And we look at whether one thing is positively promoting that within yeah. or it's negatively impacting yeah. you within. That is what we're doing within the global digital economy now. And that is the change that must be made. It's not enough to just look at one, one grain of sand on the beach. You've got to look at the beach and the ocean together. Fantastic analogy. Um, you spoke on a panel yesterday uh, yeah, yeah, on, yeah. on nuclear. I want to get to that. Tell us about the panel. Tell us uh, in in a couple of words, kind of like the big the big takeaway, the sexy takeaway uh, from that panel. I, I don't need other than you being the sexy no. takeaway. From let's the get panel. Let's, look, let's get real with it, right? I mean, I'm the eye candy. This one. <laughs> it's true. Uh, it's pretty sad when I'm the eye candy <laughs> in the data center industry. So. I have, been, I, as you know, I've been traveling around with, with Brian Smith, Department yeah. of Energy, uh, Idaho National Labs, uh, my, my good friend. And we've been doing the, the Mark and Brian show, the Brian and Mark show, depending on how you look at it, um, and, and just kind of spreading the word about nuclear and demystifying that. Unfortunately, Brian couldn't make it. He had to be at the White House. So he was going to be on the panel. Uh, we had Mina Siddiqui from uh, Arati Power. Uh, we had a gentleman from Texas uh, Nuclear Alliance. Um, we had uh, Brian Gitt from Oklo. So you got these people that are all coming from just a slightly different walk of life, mm -hmm. right? So it, it was great to have a panel set up like that. We covered a lot of ground on, on the regulatory compliance issues that we're seeing. NRC historically has had a bad name that they're the pinch point in this whole thing. And the NRC is the reason that we're not deploying. That is not the reason yeah. that we're, we're not deploying as fast as we should have. We have had a two-decade deficit in having a commercial power deployment. And there's literally been two deployments in 20 years. And other countries, China, Russia, France, you know, they're deploying faster than we are. But the thing that we have to keep in perspective with all this is we have never stopped researching. So the national laboratory uh, system within the United States has never taken the foot off the gas for the research piece. Yes, we're behind on deployment. But we're getting there. We're catching up. And the best way that we can do that is to have a really good solution for bridging power. As a, as a first scenario and in the United States, bridging power really looks like natural gas. Um, I see, you know, over there we got the Yenbacher folks mm -hmm. in their booth. Um, I'm doing a lot of work with them just to try and get alignment so that when people have a natural gas deployment and then they bring on a nuclear deployment, they can pivot right back to the natural gas deployment as their backup power. Yeah, yeah. Instead of having to rely on diesel, yeah. right? 
So that's kind of where, where we're at on, on trying to get this thing moving. And you got to do it fast. The other thing that I've been doing a lot of is spending time with like like the DOE and going to the ANS summits, American Nuclear Society summits. Um, Brian's coming, you know, Brian Smith is coming to all these events in digital infrastructure, but now I'm having the, the chance to go to the nuclear summits and listen to what's going on out there. The message that's coming out, which is really crazy, they're talking about AI. And they're having events like we are with all these headliners around, what are we going to do next with AI? What's AI look like? How are we going to build? How are we going to grow? The topics are exactly the same. But when you go and you sit in a room and you listen to people talk about these things, we talk about how are we going to deploy AI at scale from an infrastructure standpoint? Mm -hmm. How are we going to put in liquid cooling? Where are we going to get the construction materials? Yeah. Where are we going to get the people to run this? How? Where are we going to put the building? How are we going to cool? They're talking about it from... When we get an AI deployment, how are we going to use it for, can we do nuclear research with it? Yeah. Can we write legal briefs with it? You know, they're only looking at it from the use case scenario right now. So I come in and I'm like, this is great that you guys want it. You got to get me power before I can give it to you. Yeah. Like, I get that you, like, you're excited to be using AI, but before you can use it, we got to build it. Our industry has to build it for you. You got to give me power. Like, boy, we didn't think about that. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't run on unicorn farts, right? Like it doesn't. <laughs> what? You, you get, well, you heard it here first. No unicorn farts. The, yeah. The, the, the AI deployments don't run on unicorn <laughs> farts or Lucky Charm cereal, you know? So getting on the same page from a conversation standpoint is important because you could be living in a vacuum and think, oh yeah, the nuclear industry knows exactly what we're going to be doing in this. And they know exactly what all the problems are. Yeah. They're thinking about it from how are we going to use it. We're thinking about how are we going to deploy it until we deploy it. They can't use it. So having that conversation of a nuclear industry, you need to be thinking about natural gas as a bridging solution to help me get to the nuclear position so I can get your AI. So many things to be thinking about. And to your point, as soon as everybody gets on the same page, that page turns. And there's going to be a day when that page is going to turn and you and I are going to be retired somewhere, hopefully, you know. Uh, having a beverage on a beach, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. have gone. We have all gone to Turkey. We have all <laughs> gotten things taken care of. Um, but but my, and my point is, uh, let's talk about your work with the Nomad Futurists sure. uh, yeah. and specifically kind of the the next generation of thought leaders and solution uh, finders like yourself. Yeah. Where are they coming from? Yeah, great question. Um, workforce deficit. Yeah. We're talking about this ad nauseum. When I came in the industry, it was like. 300,000, you know, skilled labor jobs were going to be needed uh, by 2030. Uh, I think now the number last I heard was like 440,000 needed by 2030. So <laughs> we shortened a couple of years. Yeah, we still have more. Yeah. Like, we're not making up for it. Um, it's, it. It's a huge problem not being able to have it. The nuclear industry, I mentioned this when we were talking before, the nuclear industry has the same problem, by the way, that um, it's it takes a more skilled, uh, more attentive kind of person when they're coming out of their schooling yeah. to be able to work within an engineering mindset or have you know a nuclear engineering degree. But then there's also skilled trades and maintenance facilities, maintenance, uh, operational procedures, et cetera. So there's a problem on both sides, on the power side and the digital infrastructure side. And Nomad, we're really focusing on the digital infrastructure side of that, but also in the skilled labor side. So mm -hmm. that could then translate to power, mm -hmm. which, which I really like uh, that you know we can go down that path. Um, right now, we've got uh, the educational modules that are out. Uh, people can take that. The, the world can take that. So www.nomadfuturist.org uh, is our website. You can go on there. You can access our academy. You can take courses within the academy free of charge to everybody on the planet. You, you have full access to that. Be able to utilize that and get your start. Have a, a level of understanding. This is a great thing for parents in the industry who have kids that want to know what, what mom and dad do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is it going to mean for them? What can they do after college? I mean, geez, I've, and, and we can talk about it. I, you talk about your background. Yeah. And, um, you know, I come into this with a degree in theater and acting and English writing arts. And your degree was in uh, theater and journalism. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and here we are. Well, I mean, you're a little closer. To yeah, yeah. Than I. It's all an act. But it's, yeah, this is all fake. But I, how did I end up here, right? You know, so I go from my college transition and I really didn't, I did some commercial work and stuff, but I really didn't just dig in on yeah. that. But the English degree really helped. And, you know, I was passionate about wanting to work with people. Yeah. So I, yeah. I was able to parlay all that. And I think it's important that it's not necessarily what you're going to go to college for. Right. If you're going to go. Yeah, to the college. industry found us. Correct. Yeah. The industry found me. And once the industry found me, this is my favorite part about that. I don't think I've ever talked about this. This might be a little epiphany moment on JSA TV. 
once I was in the industry, this industry allowed me to do whatever I want. Once I cut apron Great strings point. off and Great I point. said, what, do, what does Mark Gusikov want to do in yeah. this industry? I traveled the entire world, totally self-funded, figured out what I wanted to do in this space. And then the industry let me do it. Everyone was very open and accommodating. I had energy. People saw the energy. They grabbed it. They used it in other places. I think that's one of our strongest suits, that we are welcoming, we're accepting, and we're intelligent enough to know when we see good resources out there, we're going to grab it. Nomad yeah. Futurist is great at yeah. that as well. I did a lot of non nonprofit work with Nomad when I was just kind of doing my search for what did I want to do in the industry. Um, and I, and I, I owe you know Nabil and Phil a lot for that, for being able to support that that journey, that search. Mm -hmm. And now that we're in it, um, we're growing like crazy. We've got uh, a, a great research. Brian Jabeck and I are uh, working on a Maleva Fund. So Maleva Fund is a fund that was started by uh, Codis Holdings, which is the Kokel brothers. You got uh, Michael, Anthony, and Gregory Kokel uh, put a significant cash infusion into a fund to help support people who are coming into the industry from high schools, colleges, postgraduate, uh, to be able to get them resources that if they don't have it, uh, that's not going to be necessarily a problem for them. It's not unlimited, so we need help. So contribute to the Maleva Fund. There's my shameless plug for the day. Uh, but as Brian Jabeck and I are sort of managing to that, we're also doing other things in the community to do local outreach in places like Columbus, Ohio, Chicago, Illinois, Denver, uh, Colorado, um, Dallas, Texas, to be able to prop up those emerging markets that are sort of growing within the space. Um, and, and get young people aware that we exist. I think it's super important. I love the work that you and the nom Nomad Futurists are doing. Uh, obviously, you're doing good work and all of your various ventures that you have going on right now. That is all the time we have, Mark. It is always a pleasure. Thanks. I think I'm going to go take a nap now. But it's thank a, you. Yeah, good, I may need one as well. Thanks, Mark. So good to see you. It's good to see you too. And thank you, viewers, for watching JSA TV. We'll see you very soon.